Welcome to It's In The Details. My name is Damian Waith, and as always, please remember to share, like, subscribe, rate, review, comment, wherever you get the show. Coming up a little later, I have to talk about the French Open. Too good, too many stories. Somehow really spectacular and also completely underwhelming at the same time. But first, y'all, I got a blast from quarantine past for you. Uh, When we started out in that whole pandemic vibe, Michael Jordan let them release The Last Dance. We all enjoyed that. And the other hot piece of entertainment at the time was Tiger King. Tiger King, and then they gave us a a little reboot, a catch-up, a recap, trying to make some more money off of everybody with a little Tiger King, where are they now type of deal. But that's not what I'm coming at you with today. What I'm coming at you with today is the miniseries, Joe vs. Carol. Now, I'm late. Months and months. This came out ago. Months and months it came out, and I didn't watch it. I just... I looked at it, we'll get to it, got to it. I'm only halfway done, four out of eight finished, but I mean, we know, we know how that went down, right? What a whirlwind. First of all, rehashing all of the Tiger King memories (laughs) a few years down the line is, is odd. It's weird. I'm not going to lie. It's very weird. Okay. But... You get to see it in a slightly different way, in a real dramatic way. That's assuming the documentary style Tiger King we got in the first place wasn't filled with drama. But this is real, real fabricated drama, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, Starring Kate McKinnon as Carol Baskin. I wouldn't have gone there first, but fantastic. I... (laughs) She just she has a way of latching on to all these little weird uh, idiosyncrasies that Carol Baskin has. And I should say Kate McKinnon of Saturday Night Live fame of the spy who dumped me fame. She had a nice little part in Bombshell. I really enjoy Kate McKinnon. Uh, John Cameron Mitchell, I think his name is Jason Cameron Mitchell. One or the other, no no disrespect, he's playing uh, Joe Exotic, and he is <laughs> so much fun as Joe Exotic. And I'm going to get to his portrayal and their portrayal a little bit later. And then we round out the big star cast. No disrespect again to all the other actors and actresses, but the big star cast is, is finished out with uh, Kyle MacLachlan playing uh, Carol Baskin's current husband. And he is just lovable almost in everything he does, even when he's a weirdo. And he does it again. Like, this guy, the husband she has now, feels so reasonable and loving. And we didn't really get a lot of that from the documentary. He was just kind of her weird husband that was around after she had been accused of murdering the husband before him. Okay? So you were looking at him kind of sideways, but him in here through four episodes, not through all eight, through four episodes, you're like, oh, this is a this is a, a regular sweet dude. You know, he's just a, and maybe that's Kyle MacLachlan. But it's all of them. These characters, specifically uh, Carol and Joe Exotic, these characters are so cartoonish in the the original Tiger King, that if it wasn't a documentary and someone just told you about it, you couldn't believe these people are real. So then when you have a a, a real dramatic adaptation of these people, you're like, what are they going to do? And I'm going to say this. Is the show great so far? No, it's not great. It's fun. It's good to watch. I can't wait to get to the end of it. I'll probably never watch it again after I watch it the first time. That said, through four episodes, via flashbacks and all sorts of things, where they could have made these people even cartoonier than they already were in real life. You have license to go as big as you want with these people. 
And through f- the first four episodes of Joe versus Carol, I found it to be um, incredibly nuanced. They really gave us uh, through four episodes a well-rounded view of these people. They really made them human. And I just did not expect that from this show. And I enjoy it because we also get Netflix, Tiger King out of all of these people um, here and there. All sort, all of the weird relationships. We've got all the characters you want. Uh, Saf is in it. We got the dude who's missing a couple legs. I mean, the dude who's missing both legs. <laughs> Like, we got three or four. We got the dude who's missing a couple legs. Um, We got all of uh, Carol Baskin's hanger-ons. Everybody you want to see is in it. Oh, the the dude from Inside Edition who who filmed the original um, footage. I can't call it a documentary because it seems like they were there for a different reason. But he's in it, too. I believe he's being played by William Fickner, who you've seen him in everything but incredibly nuanced. They really round out these characters. Joe Joe Exotic, they take us back into the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, when he was just coming to grips with who, his sexual orientation and who he is and uh, meeting different mentors in places who really pushed him to be who uh, he is authentically. Not the, not the, the Tiger Zoo guy, but just like embracing his sexuality and who he can be as a person. And we get to see all of that. We get to see um, some of his uh, family, which is, which is a, nice, a nice touch. I mean, when I say these people are nuanced, I'm not saying uh, that they're necessarily uh, good people wholly. And none of us really are. We're all bits and pieces of good and bad. And you try to get through the world without doing too much damage to one another uh, as you move through. But they rounded them out nicely. Uh, Then you got Carol Baskin. I mean, (laughs) Kate McKinnon does not play her as if she's just a regular sane woman. But when they build out her whole storyline and they give us the the wonderful businesswoman that she is and uh, a lot of the strife that she went through, uh, parents, um, different uh, men that have come in and out of her life and treated her really poorly. And, And that Don Lewis, who was the husband, I believe, there might have been two, but but the recent husband who who has gone missing, whom she is accused of murdering. Now, killing another person is not something we can stand by, unless it's self defense. If it's if it's your life or theirs, you gotta you gotta protect yourself, right? And they paint a picture of this Don Lewis, where. I'm not saying they're trying to make us feel okay that she may have killed this man. But he was not a nice person. At least the person they give us in the show. He was not a nice person. He treated her very poorly. And um, he's missing. She says she didn't have anything to do with it. He's missing. He treated her very poorly and he's missing. But an incredible businesswoman. I, I, I talked about um, I talked about Super Pumped a couple weeks back. We were talking about corporations and greed and whatnot, and there was also some Ariana Huffington, as played by Uma Thurman in Super Pumped, and Ariana Huffington created the Huffington Post, and she had all these people writing for the Huffington Post and paid them nothing. Nada. And got away with it and then sold the company for like $300 million. (laughs) And I think she was forced to pay them something later on. But she paid them in exposure, right? 
that's the kind of ruthless business that some of these people run. And I bring her up because you got Carol Baskin, who's out here uh, funding this enormous exotic animal zoo and not paying any of the people that work there. Well, I shouldn't say none of them, but the, 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 the machine, the force, all of the, the volunteers who happen to be uh, earlier in life that she didn't pay any of them. And they even include a piece in the show, right in the first episode. Carol, why don't you pay the volunteers? And she says, well, I don't want mercenaries. I want patriots. <laughs> and another through line through these first few episodes is the, uh, 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 she's been called to serve and protect these animals. And she's always telling the people that work for the organization that we've been called to serve these animals, right? And protect these animals. And uh, you haven't. Nah, you haven't. You, you feel passion for these animals. And these people feel passionate about helping to protect these animals. But there has been no call to serve. The, the Lord did not bestow upon you the need to go protect tigers while raking in dollars. That just, it did not happen. Um, but that's kind of the vibe with these types of people is they seem to create these cults. They, you just can't get away from it. She is creating or has created her cult um, it seems mainly on the backs of a lot of younger folks who want to be in and around this industry and get to be around these exotic animals that you just could not have imagined you would have ever, would ever be around. And you get to work with them, right? So you can call on people to do that for that express purpose alone. But then when you say, also, there are all these other zoos or things that call themselves zoos um, and people who have private zoos and they've got tigers and they're doing these things that are so heinous to these animals. And I'm not saying they aren't, but they're doing these things that are so heinous to these animals that we got to save them. We got to save them. And we got to do everything we can do to save these animals. You cool cats and kittens, you know? And uh, people just, they flock to them. They flock to these places because there's nothing like it. And there's, there's harm being done to these innocent animals. And I can help them. I can help them with Carol Baskin's help. And then you look up and you've been there for six years and you ain't getting paid. <laughs> you ain't getting paid. You're doing a lot of work. And a lot of that work is hazardous. But you haven't been paid. And... That's cult-like behavior. Then you float over to Mr. Joe Exotic's uh, zoo, where he's got the, the land of misfit animals and humans. And he's just taking in all sorts of people down on their luck. No family, no friends, just got out of jail, whatever it is. He's taking all of those people in, and they're living on the premises. Because we don't have any money to pay you either, really. Right? You're feeding them with scraps from, from grocery stores, meat that's gone bad. All you got to do is cook it, apparently. And then Joe parlays that into flipping straight dudes, into gay or bisexual dudes. And now he's got a harem of dudes <laughs> that he's marrying two dudes at a time. Everybody's sleeping in the same bed. Is there a male equivalent of harem? Is it a, a would it be a harem? You know what I'm, I'm just, but he's got a harem and he's got his own cult. They, they've also, and I guess this is impossible to get away with with Carol Baskin, but they've got so many great cat puns in it. Like I already, they show you um, what they perceived to be her 
working her way into her on-screen personality with the cool cats and kittens. We get to see a little insight on that. Who knows if it's real or not? does not matter. Uh, and another thing, they have to take one of these tigers to a vet. And this is something I don't think... I've had a couple pets. None of them have died. Foster situations, whatever. I've had a couple pets. And you never think about going to the vet when it's, when it's time. You know, when it's the sad time. You never think of going to the vet, the vet coming out of the operating room and telling you, Chairman Meow is not going to make it. You know, you just, you never think about the impact of having a doctor give you bad news with the name of your pet and they got to say, you know, Mr. Fluffy's is not going to, it's not going to make it, you know? I can't imagine what that's like to hear. I would rather you walk in the room and go, listen, dog, Duke is not going to make it, you know? Ghost is about to be a ghost for real, you know? Mr. Flapjacks is not going to flip again. You know, that's just... Just be careful with the names of the pets, you know? That's all I'm saying. Y'all, it is fun. I can't lie. Reliving it. <laughs> Reliving the ghost of quarantine past. Going back through Tiger King. It has been fun. It has been fun. I can't wait to finish it. Uh, you should be able to catch it wherever. I mean, if you got cable or you stream stuff somewhere, you can get a hold of Joe versus Carol. The performances are, are, are strong. They're strong. Am I, it's growing on me as I talk about it. I might like this more than I thought I did. But Joe versus Carol, it, it's good, man. It's good. Check it out. As I said off the top, French Open. The French Open was a good tournament. I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm a tennis lover, so I enjoyed it. But the, I, I had some, I had some gripes. There was a little bit. There were little pieces of underwhelming in the French Open. First of all, these French people are so precious about their clay. They're so precious about their little fancy clay. And no disrespect to you and your clay. I was just talking to a friend. We want to go to the French Open. We want to go be a part of it, and experience all the things, right? Fine. But they're so precious about their clay and their clay uh, leaving little marks because of the ball hitting it so that we don't need to use this, this Hawkeye system where we got cameras everywhere on all the lines, computer systems to digest this information and seconds after the point's over, tell you if the ball was in or out. But the French Open goes, no, 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 baby. No, no, no. We can see the marks. So the refs can get up and down out of their chair and run to these marks on the, on the court to tell us if the ball was in or out instead of the computers telling us the ball was in or out. That's cute. That's cute. Um, problem is, when you run the cameras and the computers, they sometimes show you that balls we thought were out were in, and balls we thought were in were out. And by how much room? Millimeters. Millimeters. Guess what? If the ball was in or out by one millimeter, dust and clay and wind and all sorts of stuff just barely touching the line, all of that stuff, and you're telling me that this normal human being is going to climb down off their chair, run across this clay court, and get to the mark and go, yeah, that was out for sure. No, I can see it. Look, I'm pointing at the line. Uh, out, out. I can see it was out. A millimeter? A millimeter. And what I'm saying to you is, you're using this system all year round. Okay, some people like how many challenges they get or don't get. I'm not here for all of that. What I'm saying is, this is the tried and tested and true method that we're rolling with nowadays. 
And because we go to some clay in France, you're going to tell me you could see a millimeter of space between the ball or the ball touching the line. That's not possible. Stop this foolishness, please, by next year. It's ridiculous. Why are we pretending? <laughs> Why are we pretending? Because there's marks on the court. Can't you see? <sighs> Whatever. To the tennis. Rafael Nadal has won two majors in a row, baby. Now, I was not a Rafael Nadal fan from the jump. I kind of liked Federer a little bit. I was still hanging on to Agassi and Sampras. But I've come around to Nadal. Because I'm growing to appreciate the sheer will that some of these dudes have to just not let you be better than me, right? And he made it to the final. He won. He had to play Djokovic in the quarters. They had a very interesting match. They had uh, two or three games in one of the sets that took about an hour and a half. Just the three games in the set. I cooked a whole meal. I cooked an entire meal during those three games, okay? And I don't cook fast. I cook delicious, but I don't cook fast. So he beat Djokovic in the quarters. Then he played Sasha Zverev from Germany in the semifinals. And I am... A Sasha Zverev fan. I like a lot of stuff about him. I like that he does not care how long his hair is. I just like it. I like that he doesn't wear sleeves. I like that my man plays in gold chains, dog. He plays in gold chains every match. I just like him. I like him. He's big and long. He's fast and strong. I like Sasha Zverev. In the press conference leading up to the match. Sasha had the nerve to say, I'm not 20 anymore. I'm not 20 or 21 anymore. I'm 25. <laughs> I'm not 20 or 21 anymore. I'm 25. I could beat him at this match now. It's going to be hard, but I could get him. And I thought, um, well, one... I've never felt older laughing at someone telling me why they were going to do something because they were 25. I'm not saying he can't do it. I'm just saying perspective is a wonderful thing when you go, I'm not 20 or 21, I'm 25. Oh, okay. So those four years, those four or five years have made a huge life-changing difference in what you're going to go do against Rafael Nadal. Okay, fine. It's not like he said 28. If he said I was 28, I'd be like, okay, I, I get that. I, I, I could see why you're like, I'm not 20 anymore. I'm 28. I'm a man. I put on these muscles. I put on the strength, the experience. I could see that, right? But he said 25, so I laughed at him. Remember, I like this guy. And uh, he goes and he plays the match with Nadal. And it's, go, it's going, it's a tight match. It's, go, it's about three hours. They've only played two sets. And then Sasha tore up every ligament on the outside of his ankle. And the match ended. And I screamed when it happened because it was a good match. I wanted Nadal to win. But it was going strong. And I would have been fine with Zverev winning too. But that did not happen. And he had to retire. Nadal goes to the finals and beats the breaks off of this dude that trains at his academy. He beat him in three sets, straight sets. I think that guy won four games. It was one-way traffic. So spectacular and underwhelming. Now, if we roll to the lady side, we had my girl Iga, Iga Sviantek. And she made it all the way to the finals, won 35 matches in a row. She's won her last four tournaments before getting to the French. And she won the French three years ago, two years ago. And she had to play Coco Goff. Coco Goff, who is now 18, she first came on the scene for me at 15. And since then, people have been gassing her up, hyping up Coco. Coco is going to be this thing. Coco is going to be that thing. With the Williams sisters essentially falling off the tour, people are looking at Coco like, I mean, you see, we got a. We got a little bit of a vacuum we need you to fill. Sloane Sloan Stevens, 
She didn't want to fill that vacuum. She got her check from the U.S. Open. And she was like, oh, my goodness, all this money for me? And she was like, I'll play. I keep playing. I'm an athlete. I'm a very strong, proficient athlete. But winning all these tournaments isn't really my deal. So people were looking at Coco. Coco couldn't get it done for the first couple, three years. But now we're here. I look up. Coco's graduated high school. She, she's celebrating in France with all sorts of wonderful pictures. And then when she gets in front of the microphone, Coco's damn near a full-grown woman now. She sounds like a <laughs> she sounds like a well-seasoned woman, like a young woman. And I was stunned and I was happy for her. I was like, she sounds great. She sounds like she's got a head on her shoulders. This is gonna be fantastic. She made it to the finals to play Iga. Coco didn't have to play anybody. She did not play a person in the top 30 until she got to the finals to play Iga. And uh drumming. She got a drumming too. Um, the crowd was pulling for this poor girl. It was really tense, really tense. They were very quiet through the first three, four, set, three, four games. Sorry, they were very quiet. There was a lot of tension, but uh, everybody, about twenty minutes in, everybody just unclenched the butt cheeks. This is more one-way traffic, right? And Ega just ran through Coco. Coco was crying. Uh, I'm sure she'll be fine. She's very strong, uh, or appears to be a very strong young lady. She's got a wonderful support system. Uh, I'm gonna need y'all to Google the Goth family at the French Open because it's something you need to see. Uh, Coco is named after her father. He was a basketball, I think it was high school basketball star, maybe college, but I think high school. Mom was, I believe, a track star. So they got those two genes together. And if you see Coco, Coco looks like a superhero, okay? Coco's the oldest. She's got two younger brothers. I believe uh, Corey and, and Cody or something like that. And this whole family, Okay, when you look at this whole family on the screen, <laughs> and the boys are the boys are athletes as well. I don't know what's going to happen to them. I think Coco's eighteen. I think the next one's fourteen, and the next one's nine. I think that's how it breaks down. So who knows where they're going to go? But with the genes, with the genes, boy, uh, we're going to have to look out for this Goth family. I think. I think we're going to have to look out for this Goth family. I think it's going to be great. And again. Google that goth family at the French Open because those boys were sitting in the front row saying, I know y'all know her, <laughs> but we're about to be stars too. So get to know us as well. It was fun. Oh, 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 oh. Also, my girl Iga. Iga and her team, once they took over the number one ranking in tennis, did this marketing scheme where they changed the I in Iga to a one. And now she is one GA as Iga. While this is an incredible flex and I am on board. <laughs> I am on board. Maybe I'm on board because I like her. Maybe I like her even more because they did this. You have to know you're going to hold on to that number one spot if you're going to do marketing and merch behind Iga with a one. You have to know. And what happened in tennis, for those who might not know, the world number one, Ash Barty, she played tennis for a handful of years, won a handful of majors, and said, you know what, I got, I'm good at other stuff too. So I hope you guys enjoyed this little three, four year run of me playing dominating tennis, but I'm going to go over here. I'm, she's playing golf now. She was playing rugby before, I think. And then she, I think she went tennis, rugby, tennis, now into golf. So there was a vacuum. There's a lot of talk about vacuums today. There was a vacuum at that number one spot. And Iga, I think, was two or three at the time when, when Ash Barty left. And Iga and her team must have looked around and said, listen, someone's got to be number one. Our girl can do it. She's going to need to buckle down. She's going to need to change up some habits. She's going to need to do whatever she's got to do. And us, we're going to have to do some things too. But there's a vacuum and we need to step in and fill it. 
And they stepped in and filled it to the tune of 36 matches in a row. (laughs) Just in perspective. Since 2000, there's only like two people. Since the year 2000, there's only like two people who have had winning streaks as long as Iga's. And one of them is a Williams sister. Okay? That's the air she's floating in right now. And they said, listen, we're rolling out the one GA. We're going to bust our asses. All of us. I think there's about six of them in the tight knit team. We're going to bust all our asses. We're going to get our girl there and we're going to stay there. (laughs) And guess what? The rest of tennis, there's nothing you can do about it. And I love that. With that, I want to say thank you for joining me here on It's In The Details once again. uh, As always, please remember to share, like, rate, review, subscribe, leave a comment if you're so inclined. And with that, I'll see y'all in a week. Take care. Peace.